Hello and welcome to this conversation with the Fellowship of Reconciliation. I'm really pleased to say that today we're joined by Andrew Smith, Media Coordinator for Campaign Against the Arms Trade, who I'm sure many of you watching will have seen often stood outside courtrooms or protests, speaking up about the need to transform away from the arms trade. Andrew, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. We're looking today at the challenging uh, question if British weapons are being used to suppress American protests. What's your response to that question? Well, it's unfortunately it's a quite a complicated answer because the simple part is we don't know. And the reason for that is because although huge amounts of exports have gone to the United States, it's one of the largest buyers of British weaponry, including uh, tear gas, including uh, shields, including crowd control ammunition and things like those types of weapons. But the US is a major buyer. The government, the UK government has not published what police forces have been buying for that equipment and has not even published the quantity with which it has been exported because the type of license which is used is what's known as, non as an open license, non-limited license. So they will never have to publish the quantities which have gone over. It could be tens of millions of pounds. But what we do know is that the government has given permission to export tear gas, it has given permission to export shields, it has given permission to export rubber bullets. And that is the exact type of equipment which is being used against protesters across the United States. Um, so I think with every possibility that it has happened, and I think that the value of the government taking a stand would not just be in terms of the weapons it could remove from the situation, but also the political message it would send and the precedent it would set. So we utterly urge the government to revoke all existing licenses for this type of equipment because there's clearly a clear risk that it will be used. Do you base some of that because, you know, if we don't send weapons there, we don't send them anywhere, or are, in fact, the same sorts of weapons being sold elsewhere in the world by this country and potentially used to suppress human rights and protests? Well, in theory, UK arms export control should stop the sale of this type of equipment in its entirety because it clearly says that if um, there's a clear risk that a weapon might be used for internal repression then a sale should not go ahead. Now tear gas and rubber bullets can only be used for repression particularly when they are sold to authoritarian police forces around the world and this isn't even the first time where we can point to and where we can point to an example where UK tear gas might be getting used because in 2014 UK made tear gas was used in Hong Kong. It was used on pro-democracy campaigners. Um, and at the time, the arms company who had produced it, Kemring, said that in light of these abuses, they would reconsider their export policy. Well, the UK government said that in light of those abuses, it would review um, if whether there should be future licenses for this type of equipment. Now, 12 months later, Kemring, with the approval of the UK government, sold um, a, another batch of tear gas to Hong Kong. And we saw that tear gas being used in 2019 with the same appalling results. In fact, tear gas was used again by the Hong Kong authorities only two months ago. And there's every uh, reason to expect that it was made here in the UK. So the weapons which are being exported are being exported around the world. There are dozens of countries which the UK has licensed tear gas to over recent years. Um, and they do include some incredibly authoritarian regimes, whether it is uh, Bahrain, whether it is Qatar, uh, whether it is Egypt, whether it is the um, US police forces, which we have seen um, doing so much damage over recent weeks. Now, you've listed uh, lots of nations where people have quite severe questions about human rights, If, but often when we're out campaigning for a more peaceful and just world, then the argument comes back, well, if we didn't sell them with all our good and clear checks and balances, a far worse nation might sell them. No one ever states which the far worse nation is, so I'm not going to push you on that. But what, what would you say if we don't sell them, someone else will, so at least we've got checks, balances, and I guess some transparency. Otherwise, you wouldn't have some of those facts in front of you. Well, if you don't mind me starting initially on the point about um, arms export control supposedly being vigorous and robust, and I'll come to answer the specifics of the question, but we're always told how rigorous and robust arms export controls supposedly are, but we know that nothing can be further from the truth. We know that because 
Um, only last year, the Court of Appeal found that the UK government had been violating its own arms export laws in selling weapons to the Saudi-led coalition, which was bombing Yemen and creating the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. Now, this wasn't just another buyer of UK arms. This is the single largest buyer of UK arms in a coalition which included other major buyers as well. So if the most expensive equipment going to the biggest customer is not happening with any vigor or robustness, then it suggests that the whole system is um, fundamentally flawed to begin with. Um, but in terms of the fundamental question of if the UK didn't sell these weapons, somebody else would. I mean, that may well be true, but the UK is meant to have standards. We're always told that the UK is standing for human rights and democracy around the world, and yet it is arming and supporting some of the most brutal and authoritarian regimes in the world. We don't just want the UK to stop these arms sales, we want it to use its influence on the world stage to um, encourage other countries to do the same. And the UK has no credibility in doing that, and certainly not while it is arming and supporting human rights abusers, uh, dictatorships, and authoritarian police forces across the world. So I think that what it really underpins is the rank hypocrisy at the heart of foreign policy. And it may well be that the exports are bringing in some value for some companies, but the damage which we're doing around the world is, is priceless in effect. We have seen uh, UK made bombs and missiles hitting schools, hitting hospitals, um, hitting homes all across Yemen. Um, it's been incredibly well documented and that hasn't been enough to make the government take its um, responsibility seriously. The government cannot be trusted to follow, if the government cannot be trusted to follow its own arms export controls, then the most surefire way to ensure that UK weapons aren't used to violate international humanitarian law is not to sell them in the first place. When the Black Lives Matter movement recently uh, gained worldwide attention and uh, support because of the hideous death in the United States, it was quite interesting that one of the first things within the UK that happened was attention was drawn to the export of weapons. What have politicians done in response to this? Are you a, a lone voice or is there some momentum behind this call to stop exporting these weapons? No, it feels like there's been a very strong momentum behind this. When the initial stories went up, it was initially revealed by The Independent. We worked with them very closely on that story and on some of the follow-up stories uh, which were published around it. Um, and we knew that there would be widespread opposition, but actually the scale of opposition has been really positively surprising. Um, Don Butler, the Labour MP, organised a letter which has been signed by 166 different MPs from all across different parties calling on the government to end these arms sales, to suspend the licences. But we've also seen public petitions. There's one in particular which is on change.org which last time I checked had around 750,000 signatures on it and that's only going up. There's recently been a petition launched on the Parliament website for um, calling for a debate in Parliament which has been signed by about 15,000 people and that's going up quite uh, considerably every day so I would urge everybody watching this to uh, make sure you sign and share that petition as well. So we know where the public, the public opinion is behind a suspension, we know that a growing number of MPs are, it's time for the government to act. One thing which has been very positive is the line which has been taken by the front benches of the Liberal Democrats, the SNP, and increasingly the Labour Party as well, who are all raising um, very important questions about this, and we hope that continues. And do you think that it is a sort of, uh, when I say non-party political issue, do you think actually in reality, potentially behind closed doors, there's support in all corners of, of Parliament for a, a renewed focus because of the outrage? I mean, I would hope so. We know that a couple of Tories did sign up to um, Don Butler's letter. I can't remember the names off the top of my head, um, but I expect that there will be some because I would hope all MPs from all parties were horrified by the brutal killing of George Floyd and have been horrified by the repression which they have seen in the weeks since then because we've seen some terrible atrocities being carried out. And I would hope that it's something which parties can unite around. I expect the government will be particularly reluctant because it's also in the process of negotiating a major trade deal with the US for the aftermath of Britain leaving the European Union. 
but I think this is a, I think this one is winnable. I feel like it's something which can and already which already is and can get a further broader support. So I think the key thing has to be to ensure it stays in uh, public eye, to ensure it stays in public mind. And I suppose a key thing about the so-called special relationship between the UK and the United States is at times either nation can read some uncomfortable home truths to um, each other rather than simply go along with it, hoping that otherwise the uh, special relationship may then collapse. Do well, you think we what... have influence over President Trump? Well, this is what we're always told. We're always told that it's much better to be in the room having these tough conversations. And that's a view I can, I'm sympathetic to, but there hasn't been any, there hasn't been sufficient evidence that the UK does have this the great influence we're constantly told that it has. And that doesn't just apply to the US. It's one of the key arguments which the government gives to justify selling weapons to the Saudi regime, for example. It will always tell us that by selling these weapons, it can somehow have a positive influence on human rights. Yet in the case of Saudi Arabia, after 50 years, 60 years of UK arms sales, the human rights record of the regime is as appalling as it's ever been. So I think, I think it's very questionable. And I think in most of these kind of trade relationships, the uh, buyer will have significantly more power than the seller. Um, I think particularly in the Brexit, post-Brexit trade deal with the US, the US has all the cards at that table and I expect that is what is, I think that will be influencing the UK's response, not just on this, but on other issues as well. Thank you, Andrew. Obviously, I've come with my own uh, list of questions, but I'm sure there are some of uh, the FOR members who are here with us today who've got some questions that they would like to ask. So I'm just going to unmute everyone. There we go. So has anyone got a, a question for Andrew? I should say I'm also happy to talk about other aspects of the arms trade as well, um, if there's other, question, other countries or anything like that which you're particularly interested in. If there's any questions, if there's any questions for you. Oh, no. No. If nobody else is coming in, I was horrified two days ago by Boris Johnson's announcement about merging the Department for International Development with the Foreign Office. And I have a fear that the the aim of, of international development, to my mind, was to alleviate poverty throughout the world. And yet I'm scared that he's trying to turn it into a way of, we'll give you this aid, providing you spend it on our weapons, if you know what I mean. I'm sorry, I'm not phrasing it very well, but I, am I on the right lines, I guess I'm asking. Um, when I heard the announcement, I was very concerned about it. And it seems an awful lot of organizations in the uh, wider development sector are very concerned as well um, and I think what it, it does suggest is there'll be a further politicization of aid. I don't think it necessarily will link so much into uh, weapons as much as it will that broader foreign policy um, and the idea is in part to align aid with foreign policy. I think actually that slightly mixes, misses that aid has been used in foreign policy in the past but in any case, I think this will make the problem much worse. I think arms should be seen as part of a much wider foreign policy, particularly in the Middle East, because while the arms industry is a global industry, the UK industry is a very regionalised industry, actually. About two thirds of all UK arms sales every year go to one region, and that is the Middle East. Um, so I think we'll probably see a further alignment of development policy and foreign policy. I don't know how much of a role weapons will play in it, but certainly I expect this will be a move which arms companies will be welcoming. I certainly don't think it will be any hindrance to them. Thank you. No any other questions? I should say there's one positive thing which I should have mentioned in the questions John was asking but didn't, which is that the Scottish Parliament um, set a very positive precedent last Thursday when it uh, voted to condemn UK arms sales to the US and to call on the, US, on the UK government to suspend the sale of all anti-riot equipment. 
Um, so I think that on the question John asked about political opposition, I think they showed a very much broader political opposition. But what was very interesting about the breakdown of the vote in the Scottish Parliament was that it was something all the opposition parties and the government united on, except for the Conservatives. But even then, the Scottish Conservatives didn't vote against the motion. In fact, they abstained on it, which I thought was very important and very significant, because I think they'd been shamed into that. I think that they were, I don't think that they wanted to put their names on the record as backing the sale of tear gas to police forces who are currently using it against protesters. So I think that there's potentially really good scope on issues like this to kind of shame the government into change. Uh, um, sort of shame isn't the only way you've influenced and in Cat's history influenced governments of all political parties that have held government. Um, you often, we often see you in the courts and things like that. So I suppose FOR has a history of taking to the streets and being out in mass protests. Why is it important also actually to use things like legal avenues to try and stop and challenge things? Well, on the point about holding all governments to account, I want to underline that of the, you're right, the arms industry isn't a party political issue. Traditionally, um, Labour governments have followed much the same policies as Conservative governments. When there was a coalition government, it was a Liberal Democrat minister who was uh, presiding over um, the department which does arms sales. So it's very much been an institutional issue rather than a, a party political one. I think that's a point uh, well worth making. I think there was a potential leading up to the last election where I think a Jeremy Corbyn led government may have, done, well, I expect it would have done things very differently because he's been a lifelong um, supporter of the anti arms trade movement. Um, but historically, it's certainly been an institutional issue. In terms of the courts, we've been. Cats had two major cases, which I think are worth drawing attention to. Um, the first one was in 2006, when um, Cats challenged a decision by the uh, UK government to drop a serious fraud office investigation into corruption on during a major uh, fighter jet deal between um, BAE Systems and the Saudi Arabian uh, government. Um, and we challenged that in the High Court and won, only for it to be overturned by the House of Lords afterwards, um, which I think showed in some respects the, some of the limitations of the court. Um, but what it did do was cast it, was expose an awful lot of the, um, how the, that cosy relationship between the arms industry and government works and how close knit and com morally compromising it has been. This, um, I wasn't working for CAT at the time of that case, but um, I was at the time of our most recent case, which has been in relation to uh, the legality of arms sales to the Saudi-led coalition for use in Yemen. Um, and that case actually began in December 2015. We did a story of Newsnight announcing that it was going to be happening. And then in 2016, we went to the High Court, where we got permission to go to the High Court. Um, in 2017, we were in the High Court and lost. Um, then in 2018, we got permission to go to the Court of Appeal. Um, and then in 2019, we won in the Court of Appeal. Um, so it's been a very long, drawn out process. And in fact, we're going to be in the courts later this year, we'll be in the Supreme Court. The government is appealing the verdict. What us winning meant was that the government was banned from, uh, from approving any new licenses to Saudi Arabia for arms which could be used in Yemen. Um, so I think overnight it stopped the ability of the government to um, sell new missiles and new bombs. And so that will have had a massive impact on arms companies and made it uh, significantly harder for Saudi forces to um, fight this war. However, there were some limitations to it as well, because while that stopped future sales, it didn't stop previous sales. So a license which was agreed on, the verdict was on June 20th. Uh, last year. So a license which was um, requested on the 21st would be turned down, but a license of the same weapon which had been approved on the 19th of June would still be valid. So there was a huge contradiction there. However, one thing which the government was had to commit to doing was um, implementing a full review of how um, the weapons which had previously been licensed have been used. Um, we're going to be doing an update on that over the weeks ahead, so I would, ask, I would urge you all to uh, keep an eye on Kat's uh, Facebook and Twitter pages so we can update on what, how that is progressing. Um, but I think the reason it was significant is because it sets precedent. 
um, when we went to the courts, there is a real life um, impact, which is that less weapons are going over. Um, but also beyond that, it sets a legal precedent, which will hopefully make it much harder to do, the, to do this again in the future. And that's why it's utterly crucial that we win in the Supreme Court later this year as well. But as part of um, multiple, there's multiple tactics we have to consider. Mm -hmm. I mean, you highlighted demonstrations and we're totally um, supportive of demonstrations, cats involved in organising lots of ones against arms fairs and things like that. And we've joined you at that, thinking about places like um, outside the XL uh, Exhibition Centre, which uh, famously transformed itself from a place that hosted arms fairs to a place that helped supposedly care for the nation when it became a Nightingale Hospital. And Much better at, use of space. Well, and then this is it. Questions about climate change and things, I suppose, looking broader and longer part of FOR is about reminding us all of the dignity of all human beings. And we must recognise the immense amount of talent and skill that all people have, no matter what their work is, even if we question where the end result of their skills, what, what that creates, like hideous weapons and of war. You know, those are some still some amazing scientists. What's Kat's view about the potential to transform the arms industry away from producing weapons of war to, to other potentially more useful things? I think it's really crucial. I think, I mean, mo a lot of the points I would make are ones which you've just made, so great minds are clearly <laughs> thinking alike. But uh, yeah, the intricacy and skill which goes into making weapons is, I mean, that's very rare. Some of the most skilled engineers in um, this country, some of the most skilled engineers in the world, are currently making incredibly destructive equipment. We would much rather that those skills were being used in, in positive areas of engineering. And I think climate change is the biggest threat facing all of us. And that is exactly the kind of area which is where green energy companies are crying out for more skilled engineers. Um, and it's a sector which would hugely benefit from government support. Because what we have to remember is that the arms industry receives a huge level of government support every year. There's in fact a department of the civil service, the defence and security organisation, which is about 100 civil servants whose only job it is, is to promote arms sales around the world. They work directly with arms companies to do so. If that kind of support was instead being put into other areas of engineering, it could transform the economy. And it's not, there aren't, uh, there's a lot, a lot of good moral reasons to do it, but actually there's a lot of practical ones too. Because even though the value of arms sales isn't going down, the number of jobs are, as more of it's become automated, more of it's become globalised. Um, and as a result, there's been a long term decline in arms company jobs, despite the fact that actually, unfortunately, the industry is very much booming. Um, and so there's a very good practical case to be looking at the areas of the economy which Britain could, or in fact, any arms export to nation could be a world leader in and instead putting resources into there where it's needed. And I think particularly when it comes to uh, renewable energy sources, that's an area where it's not just potentially very good for the economy, it's also very like, vitally important to all of us as well. So I totally agree that we want to see people's skills being put to as good use as possible and building a better, greener future rather than, a, than being used for an industry which depends entirely on war and conflict in order to make a profit. So you've worked for CAT for six years. Um, FOR and CAT have been around for much longer, often talk about topics of death, destruction, government decisions we wouldn't agree with that don't build the world we want. It can be quite easy to get dragged down, really, to feel a bit fed up and, and powerless. So in your role and as, as someone employed by CAT, where do you find hope to keep on calling for a more just world to keep speaking up and challenging um, decisions to sell arms? Well, we always have to have positivity and hope um, because without it, it would be very hard to continue campaigning. And because the impacts which we're campaigning against are largely impacts which don't happen here in the UK. So therefore, it's urgently important that we show solidarity with people who are on the receiving end of um, the arms industry and are experiencing it um, through uh, water and conflict. So I think it's vitally important that we do continue, but there are also some positive outcomes as well. Um, it would have been significantly better if we never had to go to the courts 
But actually that win was a really important one and it does set a huge precedent. And I respect that abolishing the global arms industry and military industrial complex is very much a marathon and not a sprint. But it's a marathon where there are wins which we can pick up along the way. And I want to give a couple of positive examples if that's okay. Um, thinking about a particular arms fair called it's a procurement arms fair, the acronym is DPRTE. It's not a particularly well-known arms fair, but it's an arms fair which I think it was five years ago was happening, five or six years ago was happening in Bristol. And people in Bristol didn't want it there, so they turned out to protest. So the following year, the arms fair was moved, and it was moved to Cardiff. People in Cardiff were very sensible, they didn't want it there either, so they turned out to protest in large numbers. And so then it got moved again to Birmingham. Now, people in Birmingham didn't want it there either and didn't even have to turn out to protest. They only announced that they were going to protest and then the arms fair was moved to Farnborough, where it now takes place behind gigantic walls and, um, and lots of barbed wire. And I think what this shows is that when people know where the arms industry is and know that it's happening in Bay Area, they're quite rightly appalled by it. Um, and for the arms industry to be in a position where, despite all the huge amounts of money which it spends on PR, all the huge amounts of time and effort it puts into lobbying government, it's got to a point where it can only hold its events at a far removed air base um, outside of a major, out in a small town outside of a major city and behind lots of barbed wire and security guards. And that's not because there's any threat to the individuals who are taking part, it's because they didn't want to be confronted with banners or protesters reminding them about the real world impact of what we're doing. Um, and we have to see as a positive that the more people who are aware of what is happening, the more people are taking action and more people who are willing to stop it. All the polling shows that the vast majority of the public are firmly um, against arms exports. That's the case in the UK. I've seen polling in uh, France as well, and I would expect the same polling across all of Europe. Um, and, from, and therefore, what we have to really be focusing on is mobilising public opinion. But there is a positive story to tell, because our movement isn't just one which is against things. It's also one which is for a more peaceful future, for an alternative approach to international relations, and for building that greener, better world where um, the skills which are currently being put into missiles and bombs are instead being put into uh, windmills and other forms of, uh, of renewable energy. And that's the kind of future we want to be communicating and building. So we have to remain as positive as we can while telling that story. While also rightly, I don't, there's no heart, there's nothing wrong with being angry. There's a lot of which people are rightly angry about. And the impacts we're talking, which we're talking about in, in the US and Yemen and beyond are absolutely appalling. And that's something which we have to channel as well and not be afraid to do so. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, thank you for keeping our focus on the transformation that's possible. Um, the European region of uh, the International Fellowship of Reconciliation was due to be meeting in Paris a few weeks ago when the arms fair was due to meet there. Unfortunately, coronavirus meant uh, our members from around the region couldn't travel, but it also meant the arms fair couldn't happen, and it will be interesting to see that when we've discovered once that it can't happen, what other new futures are possible. So just to say thank you once again, Andrew, for your time today, for sharing all that you have, for challenging us to think more clearly as a fellowship about what it means to follow a peacemaker and to help build peace. Thank you. Thank Andrew. you very much. And it was really lovely to meet all of you. Thank you very much. I'm gonna stop thank the you. recording.